This episode was originally released as a bonus episode of Real English Radio and is now being released to the public. Enjoy. Ask versus guest culture. This is useful to know about in general, but super handy for conflict. So, I grew up in Tennessee, which is a guest culture. My husband grew up in an ask culture. What does this mean? It means that when I want something, like there's a box of cereal, I'll say the box of cereal is too high for me to reach. Now, my purpose in this is not to be passive aggressive. It's to allow someone to volunteer because putting someone in a position where they have to say no is incredibly rude. So I'm gonna do everything I can to avoid it, which means that I will state problems and let them guess about whether or not I need help. My husband comes from an ask culture, which is that you just ask if you need help. So can you get that box of cereal down for me? What this means is that for him, the request comes first and then the explanation. And for me, the explanation comes first and then the request. It also means that when I say the box of cereal is too high for me to reach, he reads it as passive aggressive. And when he says, can you get the box of cereal down for me? I read it as urgent because he's put me in a position where I might have to say no. And you only do that for things that are super important. So for both of us, it's a point of conflict, even though it's such a small thing. So think about if you have a character that is coming from ask versus guest culture. And you may also look at your own life too. Hmm? All right, my friend, welcome back to another episode of Real English Radio. I am your host, Tony Kaizen. And today we are talking about a very interesting topic. And it's the difference in cultural backgrounds, even within the same country, right? This lady is telling a story or really talking about a situation she often finds herself in with her husband, who has a different cultural background, even though, well, actually, she didn't say it in the clip, but I'm assuming they're from the same country. Even if they're not, this definitely happens between people in the same country, especially a country like the US that's so big. And in each region, you have different ways of saying things and doing things. But before I get ahead of myself, let me uh, go back to the beginning of the clip and, as always, explain the nouns, verbs, and adjectives to make sure everything's clear and you got all the context before we move on. All right. So let me go back to the beginning. I'll play it again and explain some things. Here we go. Ask versus guest culture. This is useful to know about in general, but super handy for conflict. OK, this is useful to know about in general, but super handy for conflict. So handy, H-A-N-D-Y, handy. If something is handy, it just means very useful or very convenient for a particular purpose. So what she's about to tell you will be very useful or convenient for managing conflict in the future. It will be very handy. Ask versus guest culture. This is useful to know about in general, but super handy for conflict. So I grew up in Tennessee, which is a guest culture. My husband grew up in an ask culture. What does this mean? It means that when I want something, like there's a box of cereal, I'll say the box of cereal is too high for me to reach. Okay, so two things. You probably heard the phrasal verb grow up hundreds of times, but just to refresh your memory, when she says I grew up in Tennessee, or my husband grew up in an ask culture. She's just saying I was raised or I went from a baby to an adolescent to an adult in this particular context. So she was raised by her parents, I'm assuming, in Tennessee. And her husband, I don't know where he's from, but he grew up or was raised in a different culture. She's from what she calls a guess culture. And her husband is from an ask culture. They grew up or were raised in two different cultures. So then she gives an example. She says, when I want something like there's a box of cereal and she says, the box of cereal is too high for me to reach. Reach, R-E-A-C-H, reach. All that means is to extend your hand or ex really extend your arm, right? To try and grab something with your hand. So imagine you're sitting at the kitchen table and up on the shelf, there's a box of cereal. You would have to stand up and extend your arm to then be able to grab the box or in other words, stand up and extend your arm 
to be able to reach the box. So she's not tall enough to reach or get this box. So she says to her husband, hmm, the box of cereal is too high for me to reach. I hope that makes sense, all right? So I'm going to go back a few seconds and we'll continue. Like, there's a box of cereal. I'll say the box of cereal is too high for me to reach. Now, my purpose in this is not to be passive aggressive. It's to allow someone to volunteer because putting someone in a position where they have to say no is incredibly rude. Okay, so her her intention is not to be passive aggressive. And so if somebody is passive aggressive, it means that they are displaying behavior that is very... Um, well, the dictionary says it's behavior characterized by indirect resistance to the demands of others and an avoidance of direct confrontation, often manifested in evasive tactics or sarcasm. Now, that's a lot of words. It might not be so clear. So passive aggressive basically is like expressing some form of aggression in a very passive way. So instead of saying what you want to say directly, you find some indirect way of expressing whatever it is you wanted to express so instead of saying hey i'm too short to reach the cereal can you reach it for me you just say indirectly oh it's too high for me to reach but your your intention is still trying to convince the other person to get the box of cereal for you but you don't want to ask them directly a lot of people would interpret that as passive aggressive behavior you're avoiding the direct speech, the direct confrontation, the direct possibility of being told no. So you choose to do it in a very passive way. It might not be the best example, but it is the example from this clip. If I had more time to think about it, I probably could come up with more examples. But, you know, at least now you should have an idea of what she means when she says passive aggressive. She's not trying to say something without saying it or avoid being direct or anything like that. It's just based on the way she was raised based on the way she grew up in her culture, it's rude to put somebody under pressure and make them tell you yes or no right now. And that's what she says after that. She says, my purpose is not to be passive aggressive. It's to allow someone to volunteer because putting someone in a position where they have to say no is incredibly rude, according to her culture and the way she was raised, right? So just the last word, volunteer. This is a noun and a verb. So you can be a volunteer. But the act, how can I, it's hard to give a definition without using the actual word, right? So you can be a volunteer, but the act is also volunteering. So what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I'm volunteering down at this shelter. Or we're going to be volunteering for this organization. This means we're going to be volunteers and do volunteer work. So basically what she's saying is the reason I say it that way, oh, the cereal's too high for me to reach, is I want somebody to voluntarily offer their help. I don't want to ask them directly and then put them under pressure and put them in a situation where they might have to tell me no, because it's rude to do that to somebody is what she's saying, right? All right, let's continue. It's to allow someone to volunteer because putting someone in a position where they have to say no is incredibly rude. So I'm going to do everything I can to avoid it, which means that I will state problems and let them guess about whether or not I need a help. Okay, so she said, I will state problems, what she said. So I'm, I'm going to do everything I can do to avoid it, which means that I will state problems and let them guess about whether or not I need help. So to state a problem, to state anything, I'm not talking about the states like the United States, but it is the same exact word, S-T-A-T-E, state. But in this case, it's a verb. And it's related to the word statement. So you can state something or make a statement, right? Those two words, if I'm not mistaken, come from the same place. They have the same root meaning, right? So to state something means to express or present information or a fact clearly and explicitly. For example, the box of cereal is too high for me to reach. That's a statement. It's a fact. I'm presenting this information to whoever's listening. I'm not making a request, which would be... Can you get that box of cereal? It's too high for me to reach. She just makes a, a plain, direct statement. Oh, it's too high. And that's it. So she states the problem and then allows other people to guess whether or not she needs help. That's what she's saying. All right. All right, let's continue. 
rude. So I'm going to do everything I can to avoid it, which means that I will state problems and let them guess about whether or not I need help. My husband comes from an ask culture, which is that you just ask if you need help. So can you get that box of cereal down for me? What this means is that for him, the request comes first and then the explanation. And for me, the explanation comes first and then the request. It also means that when I say the box of cereal is too high for me to reach, he reads it as passive aggressive. Okay, it also means that when she says the box of cereal is too high to reach, her husband reads it as passive aggressive. Now, read, and you know what that means generally speaking, right? You're processing written words um, in search of meaning, right? You read a book, you read an article, you read a text message, you know what that means. But in this case, it's much more related to the idea of interpretation. So when she says, oh, the box of cereal is too high for me to reach, her husband interprets that statement and that, that behavior as passive aggressive behavior. That's the way he interprets it, even if that's not her intention. He, so he's reading the situation in a particular way, or he's interpreting the situation in a particular way. And you can use this in any situation. You can read any situation, whether you're with your kids, at work, in the gym, at the mall, the grocery store, at a park, it doesn't matter. You can read a situation, or you can read someone's body language, or you can read what somebody's trying to communicate, you can read somebody's behavior at any time. It just means to interpret or perceive the meaning of a particular statement or action or emotion being expressed. All right. All right, cool. Let me go back a few seconds and we'll keep going. When I say the box of cereal is too high for me to reach, he reads it as passive aggressive. And when he says, can you get the box of cereal down for me? I read it as urgent because he's put me in a position where I might have to say no. And you only do that for things that are super important. Okay. So last thing, when she says the box of cereal is too high for me to reach, her husband reads that or interprets that as passive aggressive. And when he says, can you get the box of cereal down for me? She reads it or interprets it as urgent. So U R G E N T urgent. You might already know this, but just in case you don't, it just means if something is urgent, it means that it needs immediate attention. It's a pressing issue. It needs to be handled or dealt with or resolved right fucking now. It's urgent, right? You can even, like you'll see in the U.S., I don't know if you have this in your country, but in the U.S., we have a place called urgent care. It's not necessarily an emergency because if it were, you would go directly to the hospital. But stuff that needs immediate attention, but it's not like a life-threatening emergency, you can go to a place called urgent care. So it's not the doctor's office, it's not the hospital. It's kind of like right there in between those two things. For those random issues when you have a health problem, you're not going to die, but you do need this thing taken care of as soon as possible. You go to urgent care. So when her husband says, can you get the box of cereal down for me? She reads that as, oh, he wants me to get it right now. It's urgent. It needs to be taken care of right now. And she's saying that he puts her in a position where she might have to say no. And in her culture, you only do that if it's something super important. And that's why the rest of the time she's basically engaging in that kind of that guess culture behavior, which is just stating a fact and then hoping or waiting for somebody to interpret it correctly to figure out what she really wants. I read it as urgent because he's put me in a position where I might have to say no, and you only do that for things that are super important. So for both of us, it's a point of conflict, even though it's such a small thing. So think about if you have a character that is coming from ask versus guest culture, and you may also look at your own life too. Hmm? All right, my friend, now, I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed listening to this, this clip because before I saw this clip, I had never really thought about the other side of the equation because me, I, was, I don't know if I was necessarily raised in an ask culture. Like when I think back to, I mean, California is really more of a guest culture, but um, I, it really depends because you can't even say like region by region or state by state generally. I mean, you can generalize, but even in the state of California, there's many different cultural backgrounds. So just because you're from California doesn't mean you're going to engage 
in most of the cultural norms from California. And that's true for anybody from any city, state, or country, obviously. But what I'm, I'm just saying, I'm thinking back on my own life and definitely in my family, like in my house, we were more of a, we had more of a direct way of dealing with each other. Like if you want something done, you say you want this thing done. Or if you need something, then you ask for it. You don't really like make indirect statements and then hope the other person knows what you're talking about. In my house, it wasn't really like that. We were very direct. But it's interesting because my mother is is not a direct person. It was more my dad who was dictating the culture in the house because he's extremely direct, similar to me. I think that's where I get it from. And um, my whole life, it was just like, if I'm thinking something, I'm going to say it. If I need something, I'll make it known. If I have a problem, I'll make it known. It's just, I say what it, I just say it the way it is. To me, it was just almost the most, it was always the most practical way of doing things. And then as I got older, I realized the importance of like communication skills and the fact that just because you say something one way and you have a particular intention doesn't mean that the other person is going to receive it in the same way with the same intention. So you have to learn how to communicate the same ideas in many ways if you want people to receive the information well or in a particular way. You have to choose your words carefully, choose your tone, choose the time that you choose to say, all these things. It's like communication was much deeper than I ever had imagined previously. And so now kind of having been on the more direct side and then having to work to practice my more indirect speech and communicating in different ways, even with all that, I had never thought about what she said in this clip, which is like people who engage in that kind of indirect speech and expect you to read the situation, even though they haven't made their needs or desires explicit, they're not necessarily doing it because they want to be passive aggressive or they're afraid of telling you what they really think. It's just culturally, that's the way they do things. And it's not necessarily passive aggressive behavior. It's just, I don't want to be rude or put you under pressure or embarrass you or humiliate you or anything like that. So in order to help you save face or maintain appearances, right? I'm not going to directly ask you, hey, can you do this for me? Because then if, if I put you in a situation where you have to say no, then I'm an asshole for making you tell me no. Apparently, that's the way these people think. I had just never considered it like that before. Because up until, that, up until recently, I always viewed that indirect way of dealing with things as cowardice. It just always felt like cowardice to me. Like, why, like we both know what you want to say. Just fucking say that shit, man. <laughs> why we play? We're adults. We're adults. I can handle hearing shit that I don't like hearing, or I can handle a request and then telling somebody, no, I don't have a problem doing that. So just fucking, fucking get on with it, man. What do you got to say? That's, all, that's how I saw it all these years. It's just passive aggressive, cowardly behavior. But then as I talk to more and more people from different parts of my country and different parts of the world, and I have the privilege of traveling to different places and being like immersed in different cultures, you really see like, man, everybody just has their own way of doing stuff. And you just have your particular way of interpreting all that stuff. And just because you interpret it a particular way, doesn't mean that's the way it is. And also it can be more than one way. Like it's this way for you and it's this way for me. And both are true. Two things can be true at the same time. You know, so for me, this is what it is. But for you, that's what it is. And both are true. And so that's why I really appreciated this clip because I love those, those thoughts or those podcast episodes or books, just information or people that really make you reconsider what you thought you knew. I love shit like that, especially when it's about communication, because I've probably said tons of times on this podcast, communication is the single most important skill you can develop no matter what it is you want to do in life how to communicate with different people at different times in different places in different ways. You cannot pay for that, man. You cannot pay for that. And no matter what you're doing in life, if you have two people of equal technical skill, but one communicates better than the other, I would bet my life on the fact that the person with better communication skills is going to win every single time, unless the person with shitty communication skills is like friends with the boss or they got some, you know, obscure connections, they got the hookup or some shit like that. But if it's just a fair competition, communication skills will win every time. And I'm sure you know this. I'm sure you know this. Part of the reason you're probably learning English 
apart from passion, personal interest, and the fact that you want to travel, is because you know there are more opportunities in life, in the job market, in business, if you can speak more than one language, particularly English. And you should also know by now, just because you speak English doesn't mean you can communicate in English. There are tons of people who can understand more or less what's being said by natives and non-natives, people that can make themselves understood relatively with their English skills. And then there are other people who invest the time and the energy into communicating well in any language, not just English. And those are the ones that stand out. Those are the ones that shine and differentiate themselves from everybody else who's trying to learn the same skills. And that's why you can go to a tech company right now. And if you want to be a programmer, for example, maybe you don't have the best technical programming skills or the most experience out of all the other applicants, but you communicate better in English, better than any other applicant trying to get that same job. There is a very high chance you will be chosen, even though you're not as technically gifted, because technical skills you can teach very easily. I shouldn't say easily, but it's much easier to teach technical skills like coding than it is to teach communication skills, how to deal with people in real time when every conversation is unpredictable, every person is different, it's different personalities and ways of saying things and behavior uh, differences and cultural norms and stuff like that, right? That's much harder to teach somebody systematically, to create a framework and a system and just follow these steps and you'll arrive at this result. Communication doesn't necessarily work like that. So somebody who's put in the work to develop that skill is much more valuable because you can't really teach that the same way I could teach a beginner how to code or how to run a restaurant, how to be a manager, how to do taxes, how to do math. Shit like that is technical and much easier to teach, right? There's formulas you can follow. I hope that makes sense to you. So yeah, this clip just really made me um, consider my own communication style and my appreciation for other communication styles and really look at it from a, a different perspective. And just because you think it's, or I, just because I think it's passive aggressive to always be dealing with things in this indirect way, doesn't mean that it's actually passive aggressive or, or a better way of saying that is it's just passive aggressive to me, but not necessarily to people engaging in that behavior. And I think, uh, resisting the urge to judge or criticize or say, this is the way it should be done. Just uh, being a little bit more open and recognizing that they have a different communication style. All that does is allow you to adapt to it more easily because you're not going to change them. So being able to adapt to their way of doing things is better for everybody, you know. And you can't make other people adapt to you because you can't force other people to do anything. So being the one who can adapt, I think, is uh, something that's always under your control and extremely valuable. Adaptability is extremely valuable. It's priceless. It's fucking priceless. You know? We even have a saying, right? They say only the strong survive. I heard that over the years, I'm sure. They probably say that in, in all languages or many other languages. And I've always thought, I don't know if that's true. I think in the past, sure, whoever's the biggest and strongest got all the fucking resources and, and sex partners and mates to reproduce and all that shit. But these days... You got to be strong, but what I think is even more important is being able to adapt to your environment, to your situation, your ability to adapt and evolve under pressure. So if you can't do that, I don't give a fuck how physically strong you are. If you can't do that, you're fucked, you know? So, I don't know, adaptability is a strength in and of itself is what I'm saying. And it's one of the most important strengths that you can possess, right? But getting on to the main talking points from this clip, I think the first thing that is interesting to consider is just the cultural nuances, the cultural differences in communication, right? Like in an ask culture, for example, people are much more direct. People tend to value directness, straightforwardness. Um, if somebody has a request, they'll just make the request. Hey, can you get that box of cereal down for me? Hey, can you take me to the airport? Hey, I don't like it when you do this. Stop doing that. Or, you know, just very direct speech, making it very clear. You don't have to guess at all what it is that they think or they feel. In a place like, for example, the Northeast of the United States has a reputation for being a very 
ask oriented culture you know they're just gonna say it the way it is they're gonna ask whatever they want they're gonna say whatever they want and you don't really have to guess what it is they're thinking and i'd say it's not just the northeast like new york boston philly detroit that's the midwest um, chicago places like this they have that reputation for being much more direct and for some people it's very hard to deal with they say oh people from new york are too aggressive they're mean they're rude when I never really saw it like that. I just saw it as they shoot straight. They just tell you like it is, which is something I've always appreciated. I, I could, I just, it's really hard for me to deal with people who are always beating around the bush, just dancing around the fucking subjects. Like, yo, let's, get, let's fucking get to it, man. <laughs> you know, so why are you wasting my time? But that's just me. That's, that's, I come from that type of culture or that way of doing things, just being very direct, right? Germans have the same reputation. Who else has a reputation for being like cold and direct? I don't know. But I know Germans definitely have that as well. Whereas a guest culture, they typically use much more indirect communication and they leave little clues, and little hints and indicators, you know, about what they're thinking or what they're feeling or what they want. And they're not just going to say it to you directly. They're not just going to come out and say hey, can you do this for me? Or, hey, I don't like that. Please stop that. They're going to find some kind of, you know, smooth, incognito way of getting their message across, right? In countries like the UK, that's not a country. Countries like England, um, Japan is another big one, right? They're really known for their guest culture, handling things in an indirect way, not calling too much attention to oneself, not humiliating or embarrassing people by saying or asking certain things, right? And they have that concept of like reading the air is I believe what I believe the, the Japanese phrase would be kuki wo yomu. Um, for my Japanese listeners, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pro- I'm pro- I probably said that wrong. But anyway, the translated, the, tr- the idea translated is like reading the air, reading the room. You walk into a room and you use these subtle social clues to understand what's going on to understand how people are feeling or what they're thinking and shit like that. Or when somebody says something, you have to interpret their indirect speech to figure out what they really want to say. Apparently, this is very common in places like Japan uh, and many other countries around the world. It's like we don't say things directly because we don't want to be rude or aggressive or embarrass other people or anything like that. We want to maintain a particular image um, so that everybody can go home With their ego intact. I don't fucking know the reason. I really don't. I got to talk to more people that grew up in this culture to try to understand it more deeply. Because for me, it's just, it seems like so much extra work. (laughs) You know, this, and this is the thing, like for me, the challenge with guest culture coming from somebody who's much more direct is like, dude, we have words for a reason. You have your words to express yourself, to let other people know what you think or how you feel or what you want or what you need, what you like and dislike. So use your fucking words. You know what I'm saying? You have words for a reason. Fucking use them. Are we, what, like, though, why are we wasting all this time, like, guessing and pretending like we both don't know what the fuck is going on, man? Just say that shit. You know? That's the way I think about it. But obviously... On the other side, it's more like, uh, well, again, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm just guessing what it is that they think. Now I have a better understanding, at least from one situation, which is like, I don't want to be rude. If there's a box of cereal that I can't reach, I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to put you under pressure and make you tell me no, because that would be rude. I understand that. But other than that, it's just like, you know... I don't know. And it was crazy, man. It's like thinking about this situation with this husband and wife. There was a time when I would actually avoid women like that. Like I wouldn't date a girl. I wouldn't even want to deal with a girl that exhibited that type of behavior. A girl that came from a guest culture. And of course, back then I didn't really look at it in that way. I just looked at it as a passive aggressive woman. I just can't. It's so much extra like mental energy (laughs) that you have to invest into figuring out what this person's trying to say when they could easily just fucking say it. But nowadays, uh, I'm definitely happy to say I'm definitely more open to different styles of communication and ways of doing things. I'm more patient and like uh, more eager to understand this person's way of seeing and doing things before 
I come to a conclusion on what I think about it, you know, which is really important. This is what this whole podcast is about, this episode in particular, but the majority of shit I talk about in relation to language and communication is just developing a level of respect and appreciation for different ways of doing things. That's really what it's about. And on my own journey, I've definitely over the years become a better communicator and uh, more appreciative of people doing things in a way that I would never do them. Because in the past, I'm just like, that's fucking stupid. That's wrong. Why would you do that? But now it's like, yeah, I can, I can see where you're coming from, you know? Still stupid, but I, <laughs> but I can see where you're coming from, you know? Live your fucking life, man. Do what you got to do. And I'll do the same. That's kind, of, uh, that's kind of my evolution, you know what I'm saying? And another thing to consider is like the way that we communicate isn't just about the words that we choose, but like the way that we structure our sentences, our requests and responses and our, our demands or our statements, right? And this is why I'm always talking about communication and not so much about language because grammar is important. Vocabulary is important. Syntax and all that type of stuff. But understanding the culture that influences the way the language is used is the most important thing, especially once you've gone past that beginner stage. In the beginner stage, it's, it's important to kind of obsess. I, you know, depending on your personality type, I can't make a general statement like that. For me, it's important to obsess over the nouns, verbs, and adjectives, where the words go in a sentence. How do you spell them? How do you pronounce them? Does this sound natural in a sentence? That type of stuff is really important to me. I really like to master the fundamentals of a language so then I can be free to just use it and, and try and make mistakes and be corrected, but with the solid foundation of this is how you construct a sentence. This is how you pronounce these words. This is how you use this word in particular context or stuff like that. You know, just the fundamentals of how the language works. But once you get past that, it's really important to understand the culture of the people because even if you know every single word in the language, if you don't know how to use the words in a natural way, if you don't know how to use the words in a way that's going to influence the people you're speaking with, what the fuck is the point of speaking the language? You know what I'm saying? So the culture always will it will always influence the way that we speak to each other the way that we listen to each other the words that we choose the way we approach situations and conflict and celebrations all these different things it's our culture that influences all of this shit so i think understanding the culture helps you perceive people's words and actions better and it also helps you understand how you will be perceived by many people of a different culture when you speak their language in a particular way, you know? So the point of this episode is to just consider the difference between an ask culture and a guess culture. Because somebody from an ask culture might say something like, hey, can you lend me your book? Hey, can I borrow your book? It's a very direct thing. It's either yes or no. And you might respond by saying, sure, here you go. And you hand them the book. Or sorry, I can't lend it to you right now. I'm reading it. I need it for whatever. And you say no. And that's the end of it. No big deal. Okay, I get it. Whereas in a, a guest culture, it might be like, man, that's a really nice book. I always wanted to read it. And then you just wait and hope that they offer it to you. I don't, I don't know how they would approach that. I really don't. You know? Somebody in a guest culture might say something like, man, it's really hot in here. God, it's so fucking hot. Jesus Christ. And they're just like hoping that somebody opens a window or turns on the AC. Whereas me, I would say, hey, could you, could you turn on the AC real quick? Or do me a favor, open that window. It's hot in here. I make the request and then if necessary, I'll give a little bit of explanation, right? Do me a favor, open that window. It's hot in here. So I want you to open the window and the reason is because I'm hot. Do me this favor real quick, you know? Stuff like that. It's really interesting to think about. Like if you're, if you're going to get some dinner tonight, you and your wife or your husband, your boyfriend, whatever, I might say something like, hey, I want some Mexican tonight. I want to get some Mexican food. I want some burritos. I want some tacos. I want something like that. And my wife could say, yeah, that's cool. No problem. Or nah, I'm not really in the mood for that. I want Italian. I want Thai. I want burgers. I want this or that. And we're speaking very directly to each other. I want this. You want that. Let's figure something out. Whereas in an indirect or like a guest culture, they might, uh, what would they say? I don't, 
I need to learn how to communicate in this way, right? I would say something like, uh, I don't know. I heard about this, this great Mexican restaurant up the street. And then maybe wait for my partner to say, oh, we should go there tonight. You want to try it? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Again, for me, it just seems like so much more work to find this indirect way to communicate what you want instead of just saying that shit. But, you know, it's just how I was raised, I guess. Because, again, like my mother is not like that. She is like she's one of those people that fears conflict and fears directly telling you to your face that she's upset with this thing or she doesn't agree or she thinks what you did is wrong or she wants this or wants that. She's always going to find some indirect way of doing or saying things. Whereas my dad, <laughs> I don't know how the fuck they got married. My dad uh, is much more like me in the sense that it's just like, look, this is what I want and I'm going to make it known. Do what you want about that shit, you know, like, I, you know. It's not that I don't care what you think or how you feel. I just want you to know exactly what I think and exactly what I feel. So you don't have to guess. I just think it makes for better, like, healthier communication when we can clearly and openly state what it is we're thinking and feeling. I shouldn't have to guess. Because what if I guess wrong? Right? What if I guess wrong? Then what? Then we got these misunderstandings and these problems and we're not talking to each other. So then that misunderstanding turns into something even bigger and we're avoiding talking about it. And now you're upset because you think that I think something, but I only think this because I misinterpreted what you said. And I only misinterpreted what you said because you didn't say it clearly. It's like, fucking A, man. Just tell me what you want. You know? I don't know. I'm just saying that it, it leaves a lot of room for misunderstanding. That's what I'm saying. When you communicate in that indirect way, especially getting back to the context of this podcast, if you're learning a different language, spoken by people from a different country on the other side of the fucking planet, so many misunderstandings happen because people aren't communicating directly with each other. And people don't take the time to study culture so that they understand the words being chosen by the natives. Because you're thinking, you're interpreting the words of the language and you understand what each individual word means but when they're put together in a sentence you're using your cultural mindset to interpret this foreign language which works sometimes but a lot of times it leads to misunderstandings because a simple sentence means something different depending on the country or the state or the city or even the neighborhood and that's culture so I'm not saying which one is right or wrong, direct or indirect. I'm just saying direct communication kind of eliminates a bit of that potential misunderstanding because you're saying exactly what you mean and nothing more. That's what I'm saying. And if you're learning a foreign language, especially like me coming from a more direct culture and, and way of doing things, it can be very challenging when everybody's kind of indirect, not really saying what they mean, but kind of saying it and you're left to like interpret the situation or read the room it can be very challenging and if you're from a guest culture and you go to an ask culture it can be very challenging because you're like man all these people are so fucking aggressive all these people are so rude you know what i mean when that's not necessarily their intention that's just their way of doing things you know that's why context culture and context culture and context they're so important man they're so important Really got to take this. And, you know, I, I talk about that sometimes. I post clips and shit like that on social. And sometimes I do get the question, like, how am I supposed to study the culture? And this is a great question. And I think one simple thing you can do is talk to more people from that culture <laughs> and just ask them your questions. Like, hey, I noticed Americans do this, this, and this. Why is that? I noticed Japanese people say this or they do this in this particular way. Why is that? Just ask people. And ask multiple people, because the, the other interesting thing is you can ask 10 different people from different regions of the country, different regions of the state, different neighborhoods in the city, and you'll get different answers. And you might think that's confusing, but to me it's beautiful, because it just re reaffirms the fact that we all perceive things in different ways. We all have our own perspective. And so by talking to 10 different people, with 10 different perspectives, you can get a much more clear perspective on the situation because you're able to consider it from different vantage points, right? 
It's not just this one way you can see it, but people from this side of town or people from this part of the country, this is the way they think about it. So the next time you talk to somebody from that part of the country or from that city or from this cultural background, you can interpret their words and actions much better because now you have a better understanding of their culture. So one simple thing you can do is just talk to more people. Really, man. That's why I'm saying it all the time. Conversation solves so many problems. Good communication skills solves so many problems. So if you want to get more immersed in the culture, you want to understand it better, talk to people from that culture. Consume their media more, their music, their YouTube videos, their podcasts, whatever. But again, always coming back to asking questions, being curious, right? That's what the Discord server is for, obviously, to make casual conversations during the week and stuff like that. But you have direct access to me. Anytime you're listening to this podcast or any other and you have something that confuses you about English or American culture or whatever, you can say, hey, Tony, I saw this. Can you explain that? Here's my doubt. I would like you to explain it. What does this mean? Do you have any thoughts on this? That's what it's for, you know, but it could be anybody. The next time you talk to a native, if they just do something that you find strange or annoying or, or intimidating or frustrating or curious, just ask the question. Just ask, you know? So that's what I would say. I don't have the secret formula, but simply asking, asking questions with a curious mind is a great way to get a better understanding of someone's culture. That's what I'll say. So anyway, I'm very curious to know what y'all think about this topic. I'm very curious to know if you feel that you grew up in an ask culture or a guess culture. And not only that, but does your own way of doing things differ from the cultural way of doing things in your country. Like again, I'm from Southern California and the West Coast, depending on the city and depending on the neighborhood, has a reputation for being a bit more indirect. You know, people will smile a lot and try to be very friendly. Hey, how you doing? And all that type of shit. Even if that's not really how they feel or what they think. It's about maintaining certain appearances and not being rude and not being too aggressive or offensive and shit like that. Certain parts of California or the entire West Coast, that's the mentality of people. But in many places on the West Coast, depending on the city and neighborhood, it's the exact opposite. We're very direct, very straight to the point. I'm going to tell you what I think and how I feel. And you can do whatever you want with that information. And so for me, growing up in California, where people are much more laid back, easygoing and indirect with that type of stuff... I'm the exact opposite, you know? I'm an easygoing guy, or at least I like to think I am, but I'm not afraid of being direct and telling you exactly what I think. And somebody on the East Coast maybe grew up in a more direct culture, but they don't like being that way. They're, they're more indirect, and they want to be polite and not be offensive or intrusive or shit like that. And you might be in the same situation. Maybe you grew up in a country where everybody's very indirect, and you're expected to read the room and, and interpret things that are not necessarily explicit. But you are more um, direct and you just prefer to be that way or vice versa. So let me know. Hit me up on Discord and let me know um, what you guys think about this topic. And have you ever even thought about this before? Because again, before I saw this clip, I had never considered that it's not just passive aggressive behavior, but they just are trying not to be rude. They don't want to put me under pressure. They're trying to be polite and considerate. And I was always interpreting it as. They're trying to protect their ego and like avoid conflict and avoid being told no or avoid, you know, shit like that. And even though that is the case, sometimes it's not always the case. So anyway, I probably asked the question three or four times. What do y'all think? I'm going to wrap up now by asking you, what do y'all think? Let me know in the comments on Patreon or on Discord or something, your thoughts on this topic. Because to me, it's, it's really, really interesting. And I look forward to doing more episodes about the art of communication because if you're listening to this podcast, you're at a point where you can understand a good amount of spoken English. And I will continue to help you understand more, speak better with the episodes of the podcast and the meetings on Discord. But the art of communication, to me, supersedes the science of language. That's what I'm trying to say. So hopefully this will just be one more episode to inspire you to continue working on not just your language skills, but your communication skills. All right, my friend, but that's it for now. Hopefully you have enjoyed yet another episode of Real English Radio. I am your host, Tony Kaizen. 
and I will certainly talk to you soon. Peace.